Good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock. It looks like most of you are already in here who have registered for our webinar this morning. We're very excited to have you all. Um, we are, um, this is actually our first webinar on Zoom. So if there are any glitches, please have patience with us as we work through some of the uh, challenges of a new program. Um, but I wanna go ahead and um, welcome you all here this morning. Before we begin, there's a few housekeeping um, things. I want you to see that at the bottom of your screen, there is a, a menu bar with a Q&A. So if you have questions throughout the program, please feel free to ask any questions. We will reserve the questions until the end um, and we'll see how much time we have left to be able to answer all of those. Um, we will be sending a recording out <clears throat> at the end of the uh, at the end of the seminar at the end of the webinar and you can watch it again if you need to um, and then at the close of the webinar you should be getting a survey so please make sure you give answer the survey and give us your feedback so we can improve our webinars moving forward um, today we have our speakers Chuck Shin he has been in the home building industry for over 50 years. Um, he started off at the NHB um, as an economist and has worked as a home builder and an educator. We also have Jim Weigel, who has his BA in economics and an MBA in finance, started off working on the banking side and has also done um, some time as a builder as well. And he works closely with us at Shin Consulting. We wanna make sure to thank our sponsors, ECI. And Chuck has a few words to share about ECI. Chuck, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, ECI is the uh, parent company for the Mark system, uh, LotView, and Lasso. And uh, if you know those systems, the Mark system is uh, a back office system, a totally integrated back office system. It is, um, it is an extremely powerful um, program. Uh, LotView is a, a lot pr program for land development. Uh, control and then lasso is your uh, is your uh, uh, marketing program uh, that that you have. Um, all of them. Lasso is probably one of the one of the best programs out there on the market, as far as you're collecting your data on your customers and uh, working there and and marks. The other thing with marks is we just finished uh, working with marks on on putting together what, what's known as an API. The API, what that means is we can go into the MARC system and directly pull down the information that we need to submit your rebates. It eliminates the need for your purchasing department to fill in spreadsheets or to go into my website and do lot by lot uh, submissions for, for the, um, the rebate money. So uh, we look at this as a fantastic opportunity to be able to help you in making sure that you get all the rebates that you're entitled to and it speeds the whole process up. The, the, one of the things that we've constantly been looking at is how do we speed up the return of your money uh, as you go through the submissions of the, for your rebates. And, and so we, we tied this in so that we can do the direct transfer of information and then we're uh, we're paying electronically, and we're paying basically in the, in, instantaneously, as opposed to batch processing checks the way we used to do. You get your money right away. So, anyway, this look at ECI. Look at these three three software programs. They're great software programs, and they've been a really good partner for us. And I appreciate them sponsoring. They're sponsoring a lot of my seminars, the webinars. They've just been an absolutely great partner. Thank you, Chuck. All right, um, before we get started, I do wanna remind you all that we cannot predict the future. And as many of you, we do hope this crisis will be over quickly. Um, however, it is important that we talk about how to prepare for the worst case scenario. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chuck and I'm, I'm gonna turn off our videos so you don't get distracted by us. Okay. In the yeah, I, one of the things Emma wanted, Emma Jane wanted to keep the picture up so that you could see how much I aged during the last three weeks uh, trying to deal with this. 
Uh, Jim and I have been through, we figured five of these in our history. We've, the, the two of us, basically 50, 40 years, 50 years of being in this business. So you've got a lot of experience. We've, our experience has been in your shoes as builders, as a banker, uh, as a consultant, as a coach, trying to help people, especially during the, uh, the, the uh, housing recession. We did over 300 webinars trying to help everybody uh, stay alive at that, at that point. Uh, so we look at this and we say, the builders have to prepare because there's, there's the, the whole world changed on March 11th, and we'll talk about that. There's, we've got a quote up there, but I want to, I want to pull that survivors aren't fearless. They use fear, then turn it into anger and focus. And that comes from a book called Deep Survival, Who Lives, Who Dies, and Why. Uh, I've got another quote that I want to, want to pull together. It's, a, it's just a, a summary of about three or four quotes. Uh, but I made the recommendation to one of my builder groups that they read Deep Survival. And I just recently, uh, about two days ago, got a response back uh, from one of the builders saying, thank you so much for recommending that book. Uh, and I have given it to all my managers and I'm giving it to my, my trade contractors for them to read to help them understand how to get through what we're, we're going through right now. Anyway, the, the quote that I read and I think it fits fairly well. It says, one of the toughest steps a survivor has to take is to discard the old world. Okay, what is our old world? Our old world is everything that happened in our housing environment before Monday, March 16th. And to accept the new environment. There is no other, no other way for his brain to settle down from panic. Although that idea seems paradoxical, it is essential. The final stage in the process of being lost, and I say, and and I put there still, still believing the old market dynamics. You got to you got basically throw everything away prior to March 16th, and panic and 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 prove to be either a beginner or an end. Uh, some give up and die frozen, and others. Stop denying and begin surviving, understanding the situation and dealing with the new environment. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. We don't know what the future has in store for us. We kind of look at it and say, this isn't going to be necessarily a V-shaped uh, uh, drop and then instantaneously back up to the environment that we had uh, pre-March uh, pre 16th. And you can't, when they tell me that I'm not going to have a vaccination for 18 months to deal with this thing, uh, we, and, and they've basically closed down the world. The, this is not going to happen. We're not going to be in this for only 30 days or 60 days. It, it's going to be much bigger than that. So anyway, when, when we get started, this all started and the date was March 11th. Yeah, that wasn't that long ago. Okay. We had a black black swan event. What happened was the the world. Mim Jane, you can you can switch to uh, six. Okay, and what what I look at here is um, Mar March 11th. The World Health Organization declared the coronavirus pandemic as a pandemic. That changed the world. We had been sitting here uh, in a housing market that's, that really took off in the fourth quarter of 2019. And we were aimed for the first two and a half months, we were aimed for having the best housing year ever since 2005. We had low interest rates, record low unemployment, strong employment growth, and both the millennials and the baby boomers were now in the market buying houses. What happened over the weekend after March 11th, and that would be like the 13th and the 14th of March, 
what we saw happen was the schools and universities closed, bars and restaurants closed, retail stores closed, theaters and amusement parks closed. On Sunday the 14th, uh, Disney closed all their uh, all, all their parks. So what what happened basically in in three days was a complete change of what we were experiencing prior to March 11th. Um, the st on Monday, the 16th, uh, the stock market fell 300 points. That was followed by 1,300 point drop on Tuesday and Wednesday. And the stock market actually dropped below 20,000 at that point. We also began to get shelter in place regulations coming at us. Uh, we were we were pretty good at now right now we have I think 36 shelter in places it, and it expanded uh, yesterday and today and in, in what we have. Residential was was spared a little bit and it was uh, declared as an essential service except for Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania closed closed down completely on home building. Um, that got expanded to Michigan. And by my last count, we have residential closed completely in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Vermont, New York, and Washington. And I haven't seen the details of the uh, shelter in place rules that came in uh, this morning, but that, that when you start saying you got 36 and that, that was a number that somebody gave me in my organization, it said 36 uh, states are closed down at this point. I know that includes uh, Washington and Puerto Rico. Uh, on the 12th and 13th, I had emergency meetings and all of the last two weeks, I've had emergency meetings with my builder groups. Um, and what we're trying to do is to help them understand the change in the environment and how to respond to the change in the environment. What I look is we're in uncharted waters. We've never, never really experienced this kind of a thing where basically the world is closed down. And, basic, and, and if you look at the United States, the United States is basically closed down. You've got 330 million people that have been impacted with what's occurred in the last three weeks. Um, there, when I look at, and then, the past downturns, there's been some kind of a safe harbor. It hasn't been the whole country. When we went through the, the oil problems, it was just the oil states and we could go to another state. We, when we uh, uh, had the, the housing recession, there were still states that were doing reasonably well and you could move to some kind of a safe harbor. Right now we have no safe harbors. Um, I anticipate that we're going to end up over the next couple of months with negative sales, where we're going to have more cancellations and sales, uh, mainly because if what happened this morning, we had 6.6 .6 million people apply for unemployment this week, this past week. Uh, that was double what was expected. They expected to see about 3 million people come into the unemployment ranks and they had 6.6 .6 pe million people go into the unemployment ranks, which means a lot of your customers, and maybe they were two income customers, they've lost one of those, one of those incomes, uh, or maybe they've lost both incomes as, as we look at it. Um, so I know that over the last two weeks and talking to my builder groups, there've been a lot of people that have been walking away from their earnest money deposits uh, one of my builders told me that he had a customer on uh, Tuesday after the Monday debacle with the, the downturn with the stocks. Um, he had somebody walk away from a $50,000 non-refundable deposit. And one of the other builders that I was talking to said he had two people walk away from $35,000 earnest money deposits and the operation. So I, I look at the fact that we may have a number of our customers that get disqualified uh, because they've lost their houses or their jobs. We also have customers that are in a panic right now and they're looking at the, did they make the right decision to buy and they're second guessing uh, that. So, uh, and again, the timing of this is, has not been very good because basically we lost our spring selling season for 2020 which was going gangbusters. 
we had fantastic operations in, uh, in, in sales. Everybody had a fantastic weekend, the weekend that the country began to close down. So uh, that's, that's kind of just looking at some of the things that we see uh, uh, that are occurring in the operation. The federal government extended the, the shelter in place rulings until the end of April. Some, of, some people have gone to June uh, and, and their shelter in place operations that they're, they're dealing with. So there's all kinds of things that are going on right now that you need to be aware of and you need to plan for. We don't know if what's going what to what's gonna happen, but you've got to put a plan together to get this taken care of. So one of the things that Jim and I did was go through what actions do you need to take to make sure that you survive? Because what we're after is for all of you to still be here next year or after this endemic, this, this, this um, virus runs its course and we find a, find a way to, to reopen up the country. So. Uh, Jim, you want to say anything before we get into the 20 items that we listed out? Yeah, just briefly, um, there are, what, what we're trying to do is, is not really spend a lot of time on the forecasting of where things may go, uh, partly because I, I think by human nature, we're all going to make forecasts of what's going to happen over the short term, what should we expect over the long term. We're going to listen to all kinds of experts who come up with those things. And, uh, and that's just human nature that we pay attention to. But what I'm going to suggest, if you actually act on that or believe them, then you're probably uh, veering off into foolish territory. Um, to me, the, the key thing is nobody can know what's going to happen a week from now or a year from now or 10 years from now. Nobody can know that. So what we, we do know is that the home building industry is one of the leading indicators to the entire economy of our, our country. And so if we just pay attention to many of the key indicators we look at each week, traffic, sales, starts, closings, cancellations, we're gonna be ahead of the curve. So we're gonna spend more time talking about that. Uh, the next thing I wanna suggest is that it, it may be a real quick down, and back up recovery, and if so, more power to all of you who believe that's the case and things get back to normal. On the other hand, uh, just today, uh, with those new unemployment figures, there are now 10 million people uh, in the last two weeks who, uh, who have filed for unemployment benefits. That's a 6% increase, or that's, a, that's an equivalent 9% unemployment rate right now. Uh, two to three weeks ago, definitely a month ago, we had the lowest unemployment rate almost ever in the 3% range. Yeah, it was history. Now that has tripled in two weeks. So for those of you who believe that somehow that that's going to that's gonna ripple through and be okay in a month or two, um, more power to you. But uh, I, I just can't, I, what I'd rather do is let's prepare for the worst. And if we miss a few sales, uh, I don't think we're going to regret that, at least not near as much as losing all of our cash. So that's why we'll, let's just get into right. that, Chuck, Chuck, whenever you're ready. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, and I've got it in the, in the presentation, but depending on who you're listening to and as forecasters, they're forced casting unemployment to get to 20 to 30%. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's, that's unheard of. That's Great and, Depression 30s level. Absolutely, it's Great Depression. So that's that's kind of what we're what we're dealing with. Um, the the slide that Emma just Emma Jane just put up, I said the U.S. The business environment changed 180 degrees on March 11th. The stock market went went into a free fall. It's still in a free fall today. It's up a little bit, but tomorrow it'll be down another uh, major amount. Um, it, it's uh, you don't know from one day to the next what in the world's going on with the stock market. Um, and what we're after is, is turn your fear into and of failure into a focus and believe this, that you can survive. That's the, 
one of the key things. Um, and I, I used always tell guys, I said, you know, as you go through the panic, the disbelief, the, you freeze up, you go through all the stages. At some point, you have to say, I'm not going to let the bastards beat me. And that's when you make the decision that you're going to survive. When that comes to your head and you said, I am so down, I am, I, I, I've got arrows pointing at me from every different direction, but I'm not going to let the bastards beat me. And that's kind of what I'm looking at is from a mental standpoint, you have to, you have to get that attitude. And so does your whole organization have to get that attitude. We are going to survive as we go through this, this downturn. So that's one of the key things that I, that I think uh, from a mental standpoint that you need to get into the, into the operation. Okay, Emma Jane, next slide. Okay, um, I make the comment here that it's not a short-term disruption of the economy. It could take at least 18 months before we even begin to get back to normal based on, based on listening to the doctors. Not necessarily listening to the president. The president is trying to keep everybody um, positive. But listen to some of the stuff that the doctors are saying uh, behind, the, behind the scenes or, or when they come up to the, to the stage. And, and uh, listen to some of the things that are being, told, being said by the uh, medical professions. So I look at it and I say, I got to prepare for at least an 18 month disruption of my market. Now, Congress passed the $2.2 billion a trillion dollar, uh, Coronavirus Act, uh, known, known as CARES. Um, we're not going to go through that. Basically, nobody knows what it is. Uh, you, talk to, you talk to a bunch of uh, experts, and, and you get all kinds of different interpretations of what's going on. I've been talking to my bank for the last week. We've been researching everything and attending webinars. There are a lot of webinars that are going on by accountants talking about the legislation, but not necessarily the details. How do you apply for some of the, some of the programs? Right now, I've been talking to uh, my bank, Wells Fargo. Um, supposedly, they're going to open up the, one of the programs on, on Friday but they don't even have the form for you to fill out to apply for the loan. Uh, and they won't have that until Friday, supposedly. Uh, the, the nice thing was that home building was designated as essential industry for most of the states. Like I said, there's, I know of five states where it has been and has not been done. And um, they basically it was, and then they're reneging on it and, and taking us out of the, uh, essential services classification in many of the states. Okay, I'm Jane. Next slide. Uh, I already talked about this, the negative sales, the low or no traffic um, realtors. Basically, the realtor traffic is gone at this point. I've got scared buyers. Um, home sales could fall. And these are, again, forecasts. It's not our forecast. But if you listen to some of the uh, the pundits, you know, they're they're talking about home sales falling 35 to 40 percent or more during the during the spring home buying season uh, as as we move forward. I don't know what you guys are experiencing right now, but uh, supposedly last week um, or the week before last, we still had some reasonably good sales. Uh, it's going to be interesting. I have meetings with all my builder groups tomorrow. It'll be interesting to see what their experience has been um, during this last week. I know that they they were expecting a a positive fourth uh, fourth or uh, first quarter, and most of the guys are coming through and saying their sales have dropped off to below what their that what their budgets were at this point. Uh, so what I what I look at is. I want, to plan, I want to plan for it, and I want to protect my cash. And one of the key things that we're going to talk about is protecting your cash as we go hey, through the, the webinar. Yes. Hey, Jeff. Chuck, I'm just going to mention that uh, you're, you're also going to notice, especially everybody, 100 people on this uh, call and others who may listen to this, 
many builders are experiencing different levels of sales uh, change. Some are seeing their sales go up a little bit. Some are not noticing much of an impact. Some are noticing big impact. So it's, it varies quite a bit by locality and the, the kind of customers that you tend to work with. So right. just, just watch it more specifically based on, on your weekly numbers. Okay. Emma Jane, slide. Okay, when, when we get into the, what the actions we're gonna need to take and, and uh, we're gonna go through 20 things that we map out that are kind of critical to be thinking about at this point as we, as we go through this downturn. So um, we'll go through each one of these and I'll just give Emma Jane a little highlight of when, when, when we need to change. Okay, Emma Jane, go. Okay, for the first one is I think get, uh, getting the right survival frame of mind and that's what we were talking about. Uh, you need to move as fast as possible from being overconfident or in denial or frozen or in panic and fear. You've got to get over that as fast as possible. It's hard. That, that drains your energy. You don't want to do anything. You are sitting there saying, I don't know. I don't know what to plan. Nothing's working and so forth. You've got to quickly get out of that mental attitude and change the mental attitude and begin to look at the environment and say, okay, what do I do based on where I am right now in, the, in this new environment? So second, I mean, that is absolutely paramount that you do that. The second thing you need to do is develop a survival business plan. Emma Jane, come on. Okay, and, and here we, you've got to determine what actions are you going to take and tie that to specific levels of business. In other words, okay, what happens if my business goes down 10%? What actions do I need to take? What happens if the business goes down 20%? What actions do I need to take? What actions 30%? 30%, what actions do I need to take? What happens if it goes down 50%? What actions do I need to take? And you, you need to pay a lot of attention to that and then tie this business plan to different levels of activity. Um, you got to also look at, uh, at, at reducing, what, what do you need to do to reduce your staff? Um, and what I say, say there is uh, try to reduce, reduce the staff once, not just dribble it out. And what I want you to do is to plan for the plan for your staff reductions now. You may never do it, but I want it to be done without emotions. Who are your core people that you need to keep? Who are, who are the people that, that you can uh, release from duty? And then how are you going to cover what they're doing with the people that you have left. That, that, that is also part of your survival business plan. Uh, but if you do it in the heat of the battle, you will postpone those decisions and because the releasing of staff tends to be the hardest decision you can make. A after the recession, I talked to all the builders, I did a survey of the builders and almost universally, the builder said the hardest thing I had to do during the downturn was to release my staff. Okay, number three, yeah, the uh, one thing. Yeah, too, go right and, ahead, Jim. And, and you can you can stay here, Emma Jane. This is fine. Um, if everything else that we're going to talk about is part of the components that should be part of that survival business plan. And uh, one one thing that you want to pay attention to is what indicators are you going to watch and use to make decisions as to it's down ten percent, or once the market starts recovering, what are you going to watch to make sure that it really is recovering. And one, one indicator I would suggest that you pay very close attention to are these new unemployment claims and continuing unemployment claims, because you can get that data for your state or a lot of times for your own regional uh, city. And, and if you watch that regularly, that, that's gonna give you some really good indications as to when this is, is over and when it's starting to recover again and how much. Right. Okay, this is this is one uh, dear to our hearts, both for Jim and I. 
Um, for what I want you to do is is get your financial house in order and hoard cash. Cash right now is king, and watch your cash outflow, uh, and and make sure that you're you're maintaining your cash. And as far as I'm concerned, cash is a heck of a lot more important than profits right now. If I've got a lot of inventory housing, if I've got land, um, I want to I want to convert that stuff into cash, and I don't want to hold on to it and say, well, it was a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar house. I'm not selling it for less than four hundred fifty thousand dollars. If you got to liquidate it, liquidate it because all your inventory, all that inventory, was accumulated or built under a different economic scenario. And what I want to do now is I want to begin to get as much in the cash as possible. One of the things, again, every time we've been through one of these downturns, one of the things that the builders say is I can't believe how much cash my company consumes. Because when we have the cash flow going through and we're living off of construction loans and, and cash inflow and lines of credit, we don't see how much money is going through the organization. When the sales are cut off and you're trying to live off of your reserves, it is unbelievable how fast those reserves disappear in the operation. So make sure that you're paying a lot of attention to your cash and probably you're going to be going to weekly cash flow forecasts as, as we move through this, uh, this, this thing that we're dealing with. Okay, number four. Emma Jane, okay, protect your borrowing ability. Again, this becomes very important. What, what I want to do is to try to reduce the amount of debt that I have, especially if you're a highly leveraged builder. And typically we are. Um, we, we, tend to get, we tend to grow as fast as we can borrow money, either from investors or from banks or wherever the money comes from. And what we look at is it, right now, what I want to do is to begin to reduce the amount of debt so I'm not uh, exposed to failure because of the debt service and all the rest of the stuff that goes on. And then the other thing is you got to stay current on all your loans. Uh, stay current with your loans, stay current with, uh, once, you, once you get in, in uh, default on any of the loans, it gets very, very difficult to, with, to operate with. Um, so we, we look at the debt and over the five different recessions that Jim and I have been involved in, it's a debt on the home inventory and land that historically is the cause for the builders to have failure and to go out of business. They, they tend to be the thing that actually kills you. Um, it, it, I, not having profits or having no negative owner's equity, I can live with negative owner's equity as long as I've got cash flowing through my organization. But if I've got a, a huge amount of debt and I can't service that debt, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up not having any cash and I'm going to be I'm going to be out of business very rapidly. So make sure that you protect your borrowing ability. Jim, any comments? Yeah, there's a few here, Chuck. Thanks. Uh, one is right now, see if you can borrow as much as you can on your home and each, each lot. If you've otherwise been, been not maximizing your borrowing on, on each home and lot and, and your borrowing base. The second one is make sure that you're, uh, you're, you're getting as much out of the, out of the closing proceeds as you possibly can. Um, and the third thing is be very careful, and I would suggest don't start any new unsold inventory for a period right. of time until those sales make sense. Um, the next thing uh, is talk with your bank regularly about what's going on, not just with, with your business, and here what, here's what you're planning to do, like here's your, Here's your survival strategy, and here's what, how you plan to implement. They'll they'll just think you're amazing to have, even have thought about it. But also ask them what's going on with the rest of their loans, because what's what's probably going to hit most of these lenders, it, it isn't going to be real estate up front. It's going to be the energy industry, the transportation. Yeah, industry. Emma, Emma Jane, oh. flip to the next slide because that's that's what we're talking about there. All right. Yeah. 
Yeah. And and I say, don't hide from the banker. Be in the banker's face. You should be setting up a meeting. Most of the time when we get ourselves into financial problem, we go hide from the bank. You don't want to hide from the bank. You want to go with your um, survival strategy and your business plan, and you want to sit with them and say, okay, I've, I've put this, this plan together, and this is what we need to do, and, but be there. And like Jim is saying, their whole portfolio is in trouble. And if I can get there, what, what they want to do is to take all those files that are on their desk, and they want to put it back in the file cabinet. Well, if I can go and help them understand the plan and work with them, my file goes back into the file cabinet and they've got all the rest of the files on their, on their desk. Okay, Jim, go ahead. Um, I think uh, the other thing is make sure that the cash accounts you have or a good portion of the cash accounts you have are in a different bank and ideally under a different bar name than the borrower uh, so, so that they don't, the bank just doesn't take your cash just for the heck of it to pay down your loan. Those are a few basic ideas. Right. Okay, the next one then, Jane. One of the things also that as, as you're meeting with your banker, try to renegotiate your loans before they get into trouble. With that, with, with your, uh, your business plan, go and show them what the business plan is. Talk to them about um, reducing, uh, changing the terms on their loans talk about reducing the interest rates, uh, talk about the uh, potential of a payment holiday on the loans um, for a period of time when the market gets to a certain point, you have a period of time for a holiday that now um, that might mean that uh, the loan gets extended uh, for the period of time that you went the holiday, but go to them and explain to them why, because you, they don't want your land, they don't want your, your houses um, so if I put a plan together and I say, all this needs to be negotiated now, um, at, at, right, right at this point, the earlier you get to the banks, the better off you're going to be. And then have regular monthly meetings, um, to, to meet with, with the, the banker to keep him abreast of exactly where you are. He can be a, he can be a real asset and helping you make it through the, this downturn. Jim's been on that side of the coin. Um, he worked for an SNL during the eighties. He also ran the largest REO department in the state of Colorado, uh, during the, uh, oil debacle of the late eighties and early nineties. And so he's got a lot of experience on that side of the coin and what the bankers are looking for, how to, how to talk to the bankers, how to put your business plan together and so forth. So Jim, this is, this is in your bailiwick. Yeah, this is exactly right. And then uh, I actually got into the home building business with a partner right after that. And one of the nice things is if, you, if your banker knows that you're, you're good at what you're doing, you're, you're going to have a first shot at any of the problem deals that they have. And you might be able to pick up some land at a, at a good price uh, as we come out of this. So Chuck, yeah. I don't have anything to add to what Chuck okay. said. He's right on. Uh, the thing that's going to be different about this compared to some of the other ones is how fast it's happening to bankers. Uh, for example, a lot of bankers uh, heard in early March that the hotels are not gonna be making their, their loan, loan payments anymore. Um, a, a lot of the airlines are not gonna- Neither, are the, neither are the restaurants, neither the airlines, neither yeah. the oil. So every, every industry you've heard about that's suffering, they're not making their payments on their loans. So the bankers are already str uh, struggling with that. Uh, one that's coming up and, and will may may affect the home builders is the mortgage loan servicing industry is under huge pressure right now. And if the Treasury Department doesn't get that fixed within the next week, uh, there, there's going to be problems in funding mortgages uh, at closings. So yeah, and, I, I, and, and to tie into that, I got a call yesterday about 11 o'clock in the morning from one of my larger volume builders in Texas. And he said his warehousing loans were called. Yeah, and where, I, ha I have line, no more warehousing loans. Yeah, what, what that means, a warehousing line is a, is a line that a bank provides a mortgage company so that the mortgage company can fund, fund their loans. So if, if the mortgage company doesn't have that warehousing line, then they have almost no cash in order to fund a loan. 
this this is a builder who does 500 to 800 houses a year. So, so just just watch out. So talk to your mortgage lenders as well. This isn't just your your bankers who provide you loans, but talk to the mortgage lenders who fund your customers at closing and make sure they have adequate funds, that their warehousing lines are working well, that, that their, their, their investor lines of credit, their investor pools are still funding loans. Because that, that's what's gonna dry up suddenly, is, is that kind of thing. Watch out. Okay, Emma J in the next one. And this again, Jim kind of touched on this a little bit, but diversify your financial institutions. Um, get, get a combination of national, local, and regional banks that you're working with. And like Jim said, keep your cash separate from the bank that is giving you your loans, uh, uh, your, your spec loans, uh, your construction loans, your land loans. You don't want your cash exposed to them. And like Jim said, maybe even put it in a different name before with a different institution. Um, also watch sweep accounts. Uh, everybody got all excited about sweep accounts because it lowers your interest rates. But what happens when the banks are in trouble, they'll sweep the account and you'll never see those funds ever again. Uh, especially if you have lines of operating lines of credit, um, they will reduce your operating lines of credit to whatever you have drawn out. And that puts you 100% out on the line of credit. They want you at 50%. They'll sweep your, they'll sweep your account and, and then still ask for more to get you down to 50% of face value of your line of credit. So watch yourself. And yeah. the other thing is national banks, you think you have a great relationship with the president of your local bank. However, he was, he was a great guy when he had authority. In these kind of times, your president bank's authority gets diluted and all decisions come from corporate. So you're gonna have decisions being made by your national banks out of Charlotte or, or uh, San Diego or San Francisco. So that's not, that local banker that you've had all these relationships with, um, his authority, is going to be reduced tremendously on his ability to work with you. Now, some of the things we're talking about, whether it's changing your cash, um, drawing, watching out for the, ca the cash sweep accounts and all, I'm not, we're not advocating in any way that you violate your loan covenants. So go through your, your loan agreements, uh, your, your, the loan documents, and, and make sure you're following that um, and, and, and if you, you are going to do something that's different, then just make sure you talk to your bank and see if you can ask for a temporary waiver for a certain amount and for a certain time. Uh, when we're talking about moving cash in a different name, I'm not, I'm not suggesting being fraudulent in any way. What I'm suggesting is if your borrower name is, is home building company and uh, just, just move that, if, if you have some extra cash, move it up to whoever the owner of that company is, is distribution or a dividend, as long as that fits within your loan covenants, and then go put the, those funds in, a, in another institution under that owner's name. I, I'm not, so, so just be careful to, not to take this as, as doing anything fraudulent or violating a loan covenant, but there's plenty of flexibility that you have within most loan documents, and you can always go talk to your lender and ask for some temporary waivers as well. Right. Okay, MJ, next one. Get ready, get ready your home inventory. Um, the home inventory, basically it got built pre, or it was at least planned and started pre-March 11th. That's the old environment. Uh, you're in a new environment, that old inventory I, I look at inventory, the longer it sits around, the more it smells like dead fish. And you got to get rid of it and turn it into cash. Uh, start fresh. But the demand, every time we've gone through one of these, the demand for the type of housing coming out of a cycle is for a different product than what we went into the, into the downturn with. That's going to be a, specifically the case here because you're going to see the millennials 
and the baby boomers being the driving force for um, the, ret the up cycle that we're going to see. And I need to have smaller houses. I need to have uh, maybe smaller lots. I need to, even my land might not be set up properly for what the product is that's going to be coming out of out of the cycle. So I want to get rid of the, rid of the inventory. The other thing that bothers me is I'm going to have cancellations. And so I can actually start seeing my inventory build, even though it, it increase in the number, even though I'm not building any houses. So just watch yourself with this overhang of inventory that you that you potentially could have, and you should be de be sitting down, developing a policy, of how you're going to eliminate your house inventory and how you're going to reduce your house inventory. And again, I'm mainly interested in the cash. I'm not interested in the profit. Uh, that's heresy as far as the profit doctor's concerned to say, uh, I, but I'm interested in getting out of that inventory, and I need to cover. The cost, my direct construction cost and my operating expenses uh, at, to, to get it to flip just, just so that I can maintain my cash flow through my organization. Okay, well, number nine. Well, yeah, go, go, Jim. I'm just, I'm just going to suggest, Chuck, um, on that inventory, all those things Chuck said are correct. If you have public builders that you're competing with, most likely they are cutting that way faster than you they're probably going to be looking at discounting it. I'd be surprised if they're starting any, any spec homes at this point. Um, so watch the discounting that's going on in your market, especially with public builders. And you're going to be, need to be a little faster and a little, little more on those discounts if you're going to get rid of those inventory homes. Yeah, the information that I'm getting is they're having uh, much greater cancellation rates than the private builders at this point. They lost their uh, their uh, discounting period of, the, of March uh, with this downturn when when the downturn occurred, and uh, I information that I just got back yesterday is they're not reducing their sales price, but they are doing a lot of discounting. So um, they're still holding their prices but they're, they're, they're discounting. And they started discounting in this last week. Okay, Emma Jane. We didn't see the comment. You wanna, com you wanna come in and give me a comment, Emma Jane? Yeah, we had somebody make a comment about the fact that they can't flip inventory that isn't done because they can't finish anything in PA. Do you have any thing that you'd like to address to that particular comment. Yeah, I know. I, I know they've got closed, they got closed down and they've been closed down. Some people got a waiver, but all those waivers at the beginning of this week were reneged on. And so nobody has any, any waivers in Pennsylvania. Uh, what I would do is try to shelter it. And I understand that they can put tarps on it. They can't even roof the houses. They, they were told by the government to tarp it the state police are enforcing it. Uh, that's the same thing in Michigan. Um, what I would do is, is get cameras out and take, take pictures of the status of the houses right now and to document it for insurance purposes because you're gonna have a lot, of, a lot of damage, a lot of theft, and you need to document exactly where the stage is of that house once it was closed down. And, and anybody that's in a, uh, in a situation where they have not been declared um, uh, an essential business and they've been closed down, uh, they need to document. I think that's also occurring in Maryland now. Uh, I think the governor closed down the beginning of this week. Uh, so uh, if you're in that situation, document, document, document at this point of exactly the status of the houses. And yeah, I, think I think Pennsylvania said they could put tarps over top of the house but they couldn't roof it, they couldn't, they couldn't enclose it. Yeah, the other thing you can do is even though you can't do work on the construction, you still can try and sell it. So you, you might be able to get a contract on that house with some flexible delivery dates. Obviously you're gonna have to discount it more than you might otherwise. So just don't stop your sales activity merely because the construction is slowed down or stopped. Yeah, and one of the things we're gonna be talking about a little uh, further down in the list is is go to uh, go go to web 
website sales. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. And I might bring Emma Jane in because she's working with some of the salespeople in our builder groups. Um, the next thing on nine is get rid of your land. Um, we got caught. Everybody was buying land. Everybody was developing land. I was talking to a builder. He had 10 new communities that, were, that he was opening up. Uh, and he said, I've put five of them on mothballs. I need some to, uh, some of the others to um, maintain sales. But he says, I've cut down, if, I'm, if it's a phase, I've cut the phases in half. So he's basically looking at the fact, he, he owns the land outright. He doesn't have any, any, uh, uh, any loans on any of his land. But he's saying, I just, I just need to watch my cash flow. Uh, I'm not building lots for two years or three years from now. So if you've if you've got a situation where you've uh, put deposit money down on land that you don't need at this point, walk from it. the The deposit money is a lot cheaper than having to service a uh, a land loan or development loan and the operation. Yeah. And what talk, Chuck's talking about is kind of a worst case. Be willing to walk from it. But go talk to those landowners. See if you can postpone the takedown schedule. So, uh, most of them are going to work with everybody these days. They're not right. going to like it. Uh, you know, just don't don't keep investing as much in land as you used to. Just postpone those takedowns. Postpone those new developments. Postpone those those new deposits on new deals, and then then see if you can just work down that land inventory you have. Uh, a lot of folks are going to negotiate with you right now. The other thing that is probably going to happen is you're going to find the ability to attract more investors uh, in your land uh, pretty soon. So even if you have land and you're slowing down, the fact that the stock market dropped 30% and is, is recovered a little bit, but is highly volatile, uh, it, it's, it's become a huge wake up call for all kinds of folks that uh, maybe real estate and land might be a little better place to put some of my money. Yeah, I would agree. And, and I'd be I'd be looking at that right now. I'd be talking to my lawyer. I'd be talking to my uh, accountant to try to where are the high equity uh, people in the market and start looking at can I put together a land bank? Uh, I can I can put a land bank together to take advantage of the deals that are going to come down the pike as we come out of this, and I can seed that land land bank with some of the land that I already own as the initial land going into the land bank and you have now i have an operation that that i can go to the banks and i can i can buy some of their foreclosed properties at 10 20 cents on the dollar as we come out of this out of this thing okay so just yeah. just be aware of that yeah and to tie this if, if you do have some debt on your land tie this with the other ones we'll talk to your lenders this is a perfect one to start extending. Go talk to them about extending the maturity dates, the repayment schedules, et cetera, right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, the other thing that we look at is assess your traffic, your contracts, and your cancellations. These, these are your lead indicators for where the market's going. So I wanna monitor my weekly traffic, my contracts, my capture rate, my cancellations. Uh, and just pay attention to it, chart it, uh, do trend analysis on it to see exactly what's what's going on because those are my those are my early warning signs. And again, I can put a plan, I can tie my plan to what I see from my traffic and my contracts and my cancellations, and I can tie a business plan to that or actions that I need to take based on based on what's going on in that arena. Okay. The next, the next one that we have, Emma Jane. Okay, meet with your current buyers. This is really important, especially in the market. As fast as the market has changed, this is really, really important. First off, uh, at this point, my buyers are in a panic state. Uh, they're not sure that they still have a job. If they still have jobs. They may have been unemployed. They're sitting at their dining room table or their kitchen table with their checkbook out and their savings account, savings account out and their uh, any investments that they have, trying to figure out 
how in the world can they afford to buy a new house? What are the, what did they do to themselves? Uh, they lost maybe 30 to uh, 40 percent of their stock investments, uh, and maybe one of them has lost a job. I need to I need to calm them down on just the fact that they bought the house. I need to look at what their employment situation is and determine what their employment situation is. What industries are they in? Uh, how secure is their employment? And then also, what is their willingness and ability to close on the home today? I need to, I need to know that right now. Uh, I should have my salespeople uh, meeting with each one of my customers that, that is under contract or is under production and go through the whole list. And, and look at what is the, and forecast the potential number of, of cancellations that I might have coming down the pike and, and how, how solid are my sales. That is gonna become very, very important for you moving forward as we go through this, this downturn. Yes, two pieces of information you wanna start assessing right away and keep paying attention to over time are what occupation is the buyer in and what, what company or industry are they in? The, the, the third piece that you wanna find out is where is the source of cash coming from if they, they have a, a, a more than normal uh, size, size down payment. So the more you can track that over time, the more you can predict how, how much of your, your sales are gonna stay intact or cancel. Yeah, I, I had a bunch of the builders over the last two weeks said, well, I'm in good shape. I've got all cash buyers. That's great. I got cash buyers. Where's the cash? Cash is in the stock market. What happened to the stock market? It's down 30, 40%. So what happened to the available cash for that cash buyer as, as they're coming in? They, they might be in worse shape than somebody who's got a job and employed and going to go get a loan. So beware of the fact that your cash buyers uh, may not have the cash to be able to go through the deal anymore. Okay. Uh, item 12. Okay. Work on reducing your direct construction costs. Uh, I got to look at it on all fronts. I got to look at the design. I got to look up the standard specifications that I'm putting into the house because they basically over the last few 15 years, I've been adding more stuff to the house. I got to look at my production efficiencies. How fast can I build the house? Uh, and is it an efficient build? I got to look at alternate materials that I can possibly use. I got to look at value engineering. I got to look at my purchasing department and can they renegotiate some of the deals that we have? And can I, can I uh, reduce the variances and reduce the amount of waste that's sitting in my job, sitting on my job sites. We got pretty wasteful over the last several years in what we're doing. And two of my consultants, Ed Houck and, and Rich Muir, uh, work in this area very heavily. Uh, it's not unusual that these guys can take five to eight thousand dollars out of out of a house by looking at the design. One of the things also, uh, you might want to look at cutting out about a hundred square feet of of space in the houses a little redesign, but what I'm doing is beginning to reduce the size, the size of the house. Oh, Ed's on as a panelist. Ed, do you want to say anything? Yeah, Chuck, I'm actually, as you're talking, I'm taking notes. These are all the things I've been working at all week long. Um, I've spent the majority of the last week and a half just reevaluating plans, plans that people thought were efficient and were not. Uh, the one of your points is we got inefficient with design. Um, so we got to get a whole lot better at the design, the, the building envelope, um, efficiencies, be smarter. Um, we just, for the last, to your point, 15 years, we've been adding stuff. As buyers, to, you know, ask for things, we add things, we, we jack the sales price a little bit. It was all good. It's bad. We, we put things in for 15 years. We got about 15 days to get things out. So um, that's been my life the last two weeks. Yeah, and you, Ed just let me know that he he was working with a builder, and you you told me you got about five thousand dollars out of one of their base houses, right? I got five thousand. I'm working with a few builders right now. Some might be on the call. One uh, one builder in particular was five thousand on little things on the exterior, 
just re-looking at how they, they're, they're using the assemblies. We're, we're letting, um, you know, we're, we're too busy to, to, to really pay attention. So somebody else is, is designing our product, our four joists, our trusses, our windows. We're not looking. And as, as, as busy as we get, all those things start to add up. So right now I'm looking, you know, trying to push for three to 5% just on the building envelope alone. And then we're diving into process procedures on the purchasing side, you know, get more lumber companies involved, get bidding out, um, just the more efficiencies. Um, we're trying to find five plus percent just on the direct construction cost. And, and this, it's, this needs to be instantaneous turnaround. One of the, one of the things going to happen is the, the public aren't going to change the product. They're going to discount. Well, every dollar you discount is a lost profit dollar. If I can reduce my direct construction costs, like what Ed was talking about, and that gives me room to reduce my, uh, my sales price and still maintain some profitability in the deal and meet the public builders. Because the public builders are just going to discount. That, that's exactly where they're going to go. Okay. All right. Um, let's go to the next one. Trim your overhead uh, to balance with whatever your sales volume is. Again, this ties into your business plan. But one of the things that we look at is most of your overhead is your staff. And what historically has been the case when the market comes down, typically we delay too long the hard decision of reducing our staff. In fact, I was with a bunch of builders yesterday and several of them said, we're holding off do, doing any reduction in staff because this thing is going to come back. It's going to be a V. Okay. Don't do that. Put a plan together, tie it to, tie, tie it to your sales volume, tie it to your cancellations, tie it to your, your traffic and make the decision and take all the emotions out of it. Do that right now uh, to, to avoid the postponement on the terminations. Um, reduce the amount of, of fixed assets that you have, eliminate them. All your company vehicles. I, I, one of the builders just recently just got rid of all the company vehicles. Uh, he's given them allowances for his superintendents, but all company vehicles uh, were disposed of over the last week. So pay attention to that. Look at uh, equipment that you might have. Um, any, anything that you've got as assets, can I turn them into, can I turn them to cash and, and try to do that? Okay. Um, Jim, you got anything on that? Uh, well, you know, just go through the specifics and I'm going to suggest uh, a little bit more in that 10%, 20% down to 70% business plan that we're talking about. You, you may have two or three rounds of staff layoffs. Uh, if, if you have, you know, more than 10, more, more than 20 people, maybe. Um, but, you know, start rating your employees, you know, who's, yep. who's the A players you want to keep and who, who can you live without? Um, start, start paying attention to that while you're relatively rational rather than in the heat of the moment when you just have, have to lay all kinds of folks off because you can't make payroll at the end of the month. Just be careful of that. Right. That was one of the first things that I did with my company. I, I've got my core that we'll, we'll keep. And then I've got uh, A, B, and Cs of when I can let them go. Not on, uh, not, not necessarily on the personality. It's all on, okay, can I cover this, this job with one of the people that I've, I've still got in the organization? Can I cover this job with somebody that I've maintained in the organization? Yeah. Have I cross-trained my staff enough to be able to cover at this lower volume uh, this, this person's job? And so it's, it's basically on the, the criticalness of the position that I need to have in the organization. And so we've done that and, and put a list and we've ranked every one of our people and, and when, the, when I need to let them go. So, and they're tied to, they're tied to the business plan. And for, for me, it's basically how much, how much uh, consulting are we doing? How much uh, rev revenue are we getting back for rebates and so forth? So, I've tied it all to, to my revenue stream and, and what we're doing and, and, and who goes first, who goes second, who goes third. The other thing is 
if you really believe this is temporary and you have the V recovery, which is fine, this strategy works there too. So if you just say, okay, we're going to reduce your salary a bit for the next couple months, or we're going to furlough you for a month or 30 days and then bring you back. Or if you, if, as long as you're balancing your overhead with your sales volume, if we get that V recovery and your sales volume starts recovering again, then just bring people back. Right. Yep. So it, it works both directions. We rolled back all the um, two weeks ago or a week ago, we've rolled back all of the, the increases for that we did at the end of the year last year uh, and with all the raises. We rolled all that back. Um, the bank, I'm dealing with Wells Fargo. Uh, it's interesting because they've basically furloughed a lot of their staff and uh, and, and they they're their bankers are on half time, it seems like, because they have one week on, one week off, one week on, one week off. And they've closed about four or five branches here in the Denver area so, to where the, the branches are just totally closed. So they have taken, there, there's my bank, National Bank, they've, they've taken a radical decision on reducing their staff and how they're reducing their staff. Um, the other thing is you can furlough them and bring them back. And and um, somebody was talking to me about furloughing, and they said, well, we furloughed our people, but we're still paying for their health insurance um, and so forth. We furloughed them, we'll bring them back at certain times, but as opposed to just firing them, we put them on a furlough. Uh, so we're still covering their, their fringe benefits and the operation. So there are a lot of ways of doing this. Uh, some builders have, have uh, uh, trimmed their staff 25%, uh, not their, their salaries 25% uh, at this point. They have not necessarily trimmed employees, but what they've done is they've rolled back their salaries by 25%. So a lot of actions going on right now, especially in this area. Okay, next, next item. Uh, confirm city, inspe city inspections, permits, and certifications of completion. This is a big issue right now because the cities are closed down. The building departments are closed down. How can I continue? They, they said, okay, home building is an essential business, but I can't get a building permit. I can't get an inspection. I can't get a cert certificate of occupancy. So yeah, I'm still in business, but I'm out of business. So one of the things you need to do is go talk to this the chief building inspector in the in the building department, and and try to find out what how are you going to uh, get a building permit? How are you going to get inspections? How are you going to get certificates of occupancy? Well, one of the things a number of the departments are doing now is taking electronic permit applications. They're allowing private engineers to do the building inspections, and they're issuing electronic certifications of occupancy based on the private engineer. Uh, doing the inspection and, and so forth. So we've got several things that are going on right now changing with the cities. If your city's not doing this, you need to, your Home Builders Association ought to be sitting down with your, your city and your municipality and coming up with a plan of action to keep you guys in, in, in business. The other thing is if the city is still inspecting, one of the things that we're finding out is they're, they're uh, issuing a, a protocol for health standards. We are building, if, if they're going to send out a, a building inspector, your house that's under construction has to meet certain qualifications for health standards. And if it doesn't, they won't inspect. So again, if that's, if the city is doing that, you need to know what it is and you need to comply with their, their health standards for having an inspector come to your house. This is, these are, these things are really critical because this is, this, this is one of those hidden things that can come and sideswipe you when you think you're okay because you're an essential uh, business, but the city is, the city's basically closed. Okay, the next thing. Confirm your distributor, your distributors and your manufacturers ability to deliver product. Uh, I just ran into a situation where a builder said, I can't get brick because the brick is manufactured in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's closed down. I can't get the brick manufactured, nor can I get it delivered. Okay, I need to, I need to talk to all of, my, all of my distributors and my manufacturers 
about the ability to get supplies and determine their ability to, to produce product for me. Again, we got, uh, we got businesses that are switching over to building face masks, to building uh, uh, ventilators, to building all kinds of stuff. And you got a, a distributor or a manufacturer who just turned this manufacturing plant over to doing something in the health, health arena and no longer building products for you. So I look at the fact and I say, okay, many states are closed down. Products can't be manufactured or shipped. Um, and, and so I need to find out from my distributor, where is the product coming from? What is, the, what is the situation with the distribution? Does he have the ability to buy it? Uh, what I, I would help, also a lot of it's coming from China, okay? Uh, and coming from overseas. So are they able to get the overseas shipments in um, to, to cover you and your, and your building? One of the things to help my suppliers, I would suggest sending out purchase orders really early and asking them to stockpile your material in their warehouse. Now, if you do that, they may ask to be paid for what they are buying uh, because they got cash problems also uh, for the warehouse. If I'm, if, if I, if they're doing that one of the, before they will warehouse, I would negotiate a deal where they get half paid half for when the product is delivered to their warehouse and then half when the product is delivered to your to your job site um, and then i would just say watch your distribution channels tremendously one of the things that scares me with all the problems with the health the the health distribution and food distribution and so forth um, and you look at this the federal government could nationalize the transportation they could nationalize the trucking industry and specifically put them in distrib distributing material for essential businesses. And if you're not an essential business, they're not shipping. So just be aware of that. The federal government is, is in charge of interstate commerce. And as, as if this gets really bad, they could, they could uh, change the way you're getting material. Just, so I'd try to get the material into my distributor as early as possible to keep my production going. Jim, any comments? Oh, that's exactly right. And you can't, you can't just do it one, one time. You're gonna have to be doing it, I don't know, once a week to every two weeks. Just, just be checking in with folks. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, the next one, 16. We're getting, we're getting close to the end and we get questions and answers. <laughs> Communicate with your trade partners as frequently as possible. Uh, one of the things you got to realize, they're further away from what actually is happening um, in the economy. They, they uh, have, were really isolated because they're still out there building inventory or building houses that are under production. Unless they got uh, closed down in the, in the five states that got closed down, they're still working. They don't even know that something has happened. Okay? So one of the first things I need to do is let them know what's going on and talk to them about how much housing I have in the pipeline right now. What, how much work do I have out in front of us? Okay. And just remember that they're isolated. They don't know. And the other thing is they once they realize that they don't have any work, they're going to go into, uh, into a massive panic attack and trying to figure out how to cover their, their, their crews. You know, I, when I had a, a framer one time uh, working up in the Midwest. He had 175 framers working for him, and he had 140 interior trim guys working for him. And I was talking to him, and I said, you know, he says, I'm responsible for over 300 families being able to put food on the table. I need to have my builders understand that and give me advance notification of when they need to have houses built. Because I have to plan for 300 families. That's my responsibility. Now you think about that and you think about he's down the pipeline and he still thinks he's got business out in front of him. And all of a sudden the business gets closed down because he is in shelter in place and not an essential business. I need to calm him down right away and I need to make him a partner. And I got to talk to him about, we are both on the same page. We both want to stay in business. 
and how can I, I need to, I need to compete. How can I make my job sites more efficient as a team? And how can we reduce our construction costs to be more competitive? Now, what the publics are going to do is just go to them and say, as of the receipt of this letter, your bid just got cut 10%. That's not what I'm after. What I'm after is you sitting down with your, your teams and sitting down and saying, okay, how can I make my job sites more efficient for you? How can I reduce the amount of, of trips that you're going to make to my job site? Can we tie, tie some things together? What can I do to help you become more efficient so that you can reduce the price? Can we change product? I've, I've, I've specified this product. Is there another product that's cheaper, more efficient, less warranty that you can, you can put in to the house that's going to allow us to be able to reduce the cost of the house? They, they work in my mess. They see my inefficiencies every day. And what I want to do is I want to bring them in as part of the team to get the efficiencies out of the team so that we can, we can be more competitive in, in our operation. Okay. Jim, anything? You've been one of those guys. J Jim had a tile and flooring company at one time after he sold his home building business uh, because he couldn't, he couldn't be in the home building business anymore because he had a non-compete. So he opened up a, a, a tile and marble and, and uh, a flooring business. Yeah, we did. Any that. comments from your standpoint of, of being a trade? You're exactly right. The, the good thing about probably most of the folks on this call is your private builders, not public. The public builders tend to treat their trades with more disdain. You have a chance to really become a builder of choice by the way you treat your trade partners during this crisis. Um, the, the more you communicate with them, the more you work with them, the more you make your building process efficient, uh, the, the better prices you're going to get over the next six months. Um, so I, I think this is a great opportunity to be talking with them about how, how to improve the, the, the houses, reduce the costs, re reduce the inefficiencies in your building process, and just keep them informed as to what's going on with your, your building process as well. Yeah, I had a great opportunity. I had a builder in uh, Orlando one time saved about fifteen hundred dollars on trusses by talking to the framer. Uh, and what they they brought the truss manufacturer and the framer in 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 had an hour meeting and reduced on the most popular plan fifteen hundred dollars out of the truss price, uh, mainly because the framer was dealing with stuff that he said, you know, I don't need that as a truss. I've got I've got uh, material on the job site, my cutoff ends and so forth, I can build that. And it's simpler for me to build it than to deal with the trust that you're, you're delivering. So one of the things that you can do is just like supplier trade, bring them together as a team and start talking about how can we change the way we're doing business to make, make it more efficient in the operation. Okay. The next one. Uh, and this was, this is pretty, straightforward. In today's environment, what we have to do is start paying a lot more attention to, to the health precautions on our job site. Um, maybe fewer than 10 people in a home at the same time. Maybe we're going to do more disinfecting and cleaning. Uh, we're going to have to supply gloves and masks uh, in, in the operation. And maybe that's not my responsibility as the, as the builder. Um, and like I said, it's probably going to be mandated by the building department uh, coming through as we come out of this to have a more healthy building uh, process. But what I look at is the fact that we ought to be proactive on this and begin to develop a protocol for healthy and health and healthy and safe job sites. Uh, and the, again, when I do that, I should post it on my job sites. Uh, on each one of the houses posted that this is a, this, these are the health precautions that we're taking in the operation. So also yeah. I can, I can market that to my consumers too. Exactly. I, I would do this as I, I would encourage everyone. This is highly important. Go get some hand washing stations as much as you're doing temporary power, get some temporary water out there, get those masks out there. They don't have to be the perfect ones. Just do some cloth things. Get, the more you can take it, do this fast, the better you, you'll look to the cities 
the inspectors, the sedate, the more you can keep us being an essential business, the more you can achieve waivers if there's a problem with that. Just just get on top of that fast. And this yep. includes all the all the warranty work as well. You you gotta be you gotta be working with those those homeowners so that you're in their house if you have to because of emergency purposes. Um, and if so, then you're taking all, all the right uh, health precautions with masks and gloves and and, and everything, washing hands, et cetera. Yep. I, and I be proactive and be early. Uh, if you're early, you can market it. Uh, you can market it to the trades. You can market it to the city. You can market it to your customer that you're taking these precautions. Okay. And I would be, I would be the leader in my community and, and putting this together. Uh, just set up a team, put, put it together, uh, get it published, get the, get the signs up. I think it's, I think it's something that's, it's going to be mandatory anyway. You might as well be proactive and do it now. Um, and the operation. Okay, uh, 18. Make model home showings, design center selections, warranty service by appointment only. Well, I, a couple of things here that uh, that's that's what we have done. Uh, we have basically closed down our model complex and we will have one customer come through our model complex uh, at a time. We won't have multiple people coming through. Um, and we will have uh, showings. But basically what everybody's scrambling with, and we've got a webinar on this next, is it Wednesday? I think we got it set for Wednesday on going to online marketing and sales and, and how to use online marketing. But this is, this is going to change the way we've done business. Some of the builders are, have already sold online in the last two weeks. I've had three or four builders say, amazing, I sold a I sold a house online. They've never seen the community. They've never seen the house. And that's where it's going. And, and one of the things I continually say is that my consumer has been ready to do this. They're used to buying online. We builders are the ones that won't let them uh, with, with our archaic way we do business. So this is going to force us to go online in the operations and, and do more and more on the Internet. So we're going to have online sales, online chat. That ought to be implemented immediately. Uh, my design centers, um, we this has been something that a lot of our builders have been talking about. What, we're, what a number of my builders have done is go to online design center appointments. And they will have one appointment in the design center to verify the colors and the setup. And what they will do is they will have an appointment and the designer will set out all the selections that they have and they will come in and see that and it's a like a one hour meeting or less uh and one person in the design center to confirm uh what the colors that they have selected at that operation or if the colors don't work the design center may have uh an alternative that they're going to make a recommendation for uh so uh that is that is on the, that is moving very very fast uh, on your warranty, and there was a question somebody was asking about warranty. Uh, one of the things that, the, that, that a number of the builders are doing right now is they will do external exterior warranty service, uh, especially since we're coming off the winter. We've got uh, landscaping, we've got final grades, we've got a lot of that stuff that needs to occur and, uh, and do out external warranty. But uh, internal warranty, uh, they've either postponed it or it is up to the customer. If the customer doesn't want to postpone it, they will send in a technician or a trade to take care of it. Uh, but it is up to the, they are leaving it up to the customer. Others have just said internal warranty is postponed until we get through uh, this crisis and then we will schedule it. They, they're, what they've told the customer, submit your warranty requests because it goes into the queue and we will take the queue as we receive the, the warranty requests uh, coming in. So they don't want the customer just to disappear and not, uh, not submit the stuff. They want, they, um, they want them to submit and they will put it into the queue based on when they receive that. Uh, on, the, uh, on the annual, uh, some of the builders are just uh, 
uh, wanting, wanting them still to submit within the 11th month or the 12th month, uh, and then they will take care of it after the fact, or uh, they're, they're just uh, extending the warranty period until we get out of, the, out of this mess. So yeah. again, a number of ways that they're taking care of that. Yeah, let me, let me mention a few things um, here that we can take advantage of what's going on with this, this crisis. A lot of people are at home right now, or they're very busy. So you can do FaceTime meetings or Zoom meetings with your, your customers and mm -hmm. take warranty, for example. Show me the issue. Go to, let's go take pictures. Let's go talk about it. You, you can still have your, your appointments. You can do a design center selection. Show me what the kind of colors you like and don't like in the house that you already have, the furnishings you already have. Show me what you got. You can do the same thing with model home showings. You can walk through the model home and do a FaceTime meeting with someone. There's, and, and because they have time, they're interested right now in, in doing stuff if they're at home and they're not as busy or if they're busy as can be and can't get away from where they're working, this is even more convenient for them. So, so take advantage of the, 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 the new ways that we're going to be able to market to people right now. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and the other thing is, and this is kind of the catch me out, but I've got a number of my builders that have actually developed online design centers. So the customers can sit at, by themselves, sit at their uh, kitchen table and do all their selections on the internet. Then it gets confirmed by, and they have their design center on a chat, so they can hit the chat button and they can talk to the designer, but they're not bothering the designer through all those selections. Then they have one meeting in the design center to confirm the actual material, the texture, the feel, and so forth of the material. Um, so there's a lot of ways of doing this. Um, the online design center takes a while to get, get put together. So that, that I would suggest that all of you be looking at going that direction. But it isn't something that you're just going to click a button and all of a sudden have an online design center set up. It, it took uh, one of my builders about a year of them putting together their online design center. But be aware that that's, that again is kind of the direction that this industry is going. Okay, on the next one, Jim just was talking about the next one, 19. Use video conferencing for your meetings, your staff, your customers, your production. Uh, we're on Zoom right now, but you can use GoToMeeting, you can use Skype, you can use a lot of different uh, different platforms to, to do this. but under the shelter in place regulations, you need to establish video conferencing for your staff. Um, and what we've done is we have a daily huddle at 8.30 in the morning for everybody. Uh, and we have a big staff meeting uh, once a week to where it's gonna run for two or three hours. Um, your production meetings can go um, into video conferencing as opposed to bringing in all my production people into the office. Um, other internal and external operating meetings can be done. I could set up uh, uh, video conferencing with my building department. I can set up video conferencing with my engineers. I can set up video conferencing with my architects. I can basically uh, uh, continue my operation, but as opposed to face-to-face -face meetings, these are gonna be video conference meetings. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to get used to it, but um, your internal and external operations uh, you can get that set up reasonably fast so that you can still maintain your relationships in the operation. With the customers, what I want to establish is, is video conference sales meetings. So my, uh, my meetings after they've signed the contract, uh, during that, that preliminary construction process, uh, we, we have video meetings for my, uh, uh, my uh, construction start meeting. I can have a video conference to go through that, to go through the plans, to go through all the selections and everything. Um, I can do that. I could do electronic signature. I can do uh, 3D virtual tours of my models so that I can do uh, online sales. And I designate as opposed to my on-site salespeople, I'm gonna have somebody who's totally focused on internet sales and using the, uh, the uh, 3D visual tours 
of the of the model homes and and go through that uh, i can do the electronic contract the electronic signatures i can do video home tours i can do video inspections i could do a a video frame inspection i can do a video homeowner orientation inspection i had one builder out of uh, out of uh, uh, Colorado Springs had just recently did a uh, uh, home inspection, a final inspection tour. Uh, he said it didn't work too well because you could see the blue tape, but you couldn't see what the blue tape was marking. So he says, I got to get a little better uh, resolution on my cameras and what I'm doing. But he says, he said it worked, it worked really well. It's just I couldn't see what was actually marked by the blue tape as we had gone through and and that's his team going through and blue taping it and then having uh, it presented to the customer uh, to show that we've we've found all these things in in the house uh, as the uh, as the inspection tour um we talked about warranty uh, ex external warranty um but not internal warranty but again I could get uh, have my customer take pictures uh, with their phone and submit their warranty issues um, again electronically through the operation. Okay, Jim, anything there? Yeah, I mean, this is no. the way we're going to go. Nope, no, no yeah. more. Okay, we'll go right ahead. All right. Um, the last thing that I have is celebrate all your wins. And celebrate the, uh, you've got to keep the morale of your whole team positive. And as you make these changes, as you begin to uh, look at these little things that we're talking about, I mean, some of them are, are little things that you need to do to, to change the way you're, you're working. But celebrate every one of these things. I mean, celebrate every contract that you get written under this new, new arena. Celebrate every contract that you saved from going to cancellation. Celebrate everything at this point. I got to have my whole team totally motivated. They're depressed right now. They're, they're at home. They're not coming to work. They have no social life whatsoever. Their social life is now an electronic social life. I mean, I just celebrated one of my daughter's birthdays. None of us could be there. So all the sisters and all the family were basically over the internet trying to celebrate somebody's birthday. Okay. Uh, how do, how do we celebrate? How do, how do we have a piece of the cake? How do we, how do we do any of this stuff? This is a new world. As far as your staff is concerned, as far as your, your trades are concerned, as far as everybody is concerned that you're dealing with. And so the least little bit of win, you want to celebrate it as, as much as you possibly can as we go through these changes that are going to occur. And by the way, these changes are going to be permanent. As we change today to cater to this environment, we're not going back to the old way of doing business. This is, this is kind of the fore, uh, foreshadowing the new way we're going to do business and the new way we're going to be selling houses. I just had somebody, I was on a webinar yesterday, and I said, oh, now we're going to go, we're, the, the housing industry is dead. We're going to go to modular construction. We're going to go through, and, and I'm saying, come on, get a life. Stop listening to all these uh, advocates for, for modular housing. Stop, stop paying attention to all these public builders. Yeah, it will change a little bit. We'll have more pre-construction of, of assemblages that we're going to be putting together. But our industry is here. What we're going to do is modify the way we do business to the new environment that we just got thrown into on March 11th. So we're open for questions and answers. Emma Jane? Chuck, we had one person ask, um, hold on, let me pull it up. He wanted to know, uh, how to address his customers or his buyers that their investment is protected. 
how to how how to talk to their customer that their investment is protected. Yes, exactly. Um, well, I you know I, I would talk about the fact that right now is the best time in the world to buy. Interest rates are low. Um, you know, uh, prices are going to go up. We've got the ability to to uh, get them into the house during this period of time, uh, and and I would talk to them about uh, uh, what we normally do. Of why is it the best time in the world to buy? And, and if they if you go to the web, if you go to the the uh, internet, there are a lot of sales and marketing consultants that are out there trying to talk to you about how to sell in this environment right now, uh, where you can get some get some. Uh, uh, Jason Forrest just did something for a group of builders that we were working with on on how to deal with them. I would go to his website. He's probably got something written out that's uh, pretty detailed on exactly how to do it. Um, I've got uh, another builder that just recently put scripts together for his salespeople so that they all are on the same page. And I would suggest you do that with your salespeople. If you've got more than one salesperson, sit down and write out a script. Um, on on how to answer your customers' questions like that on well, why is it the best time to buy a house at this point? I mean, yeah, they're financially in trouble, they're scared, but what I want to do is I want to calm them down that they're they're buying the house that they want. It's been selected for the way they want. Uh, we're still in production, um, and yeah, it, the housing is going to get uh, more expensive as we as we move forward so i would i would work with them on that way let's let's go through some of the other slides because we got a we got a couple more and then jim wanted to talk about uh that you know we said we're here for you and we just listed out some of the services that we we provide but the last thing they want to do is talk about the the uh, care act and what what the care act is is set up for uh emma switch back to the Emma Jane switch. Yeah, this is just some of the stuff that we we look at. We're, one of the things that we're really interested in is is the rebates and don't leave money on the table. This, rebates is, is you've earned it. If you use the product uh, of one of our manufacturers in the program, you've earned the rebate and you need to submit for it. Uh, and what I said is we've got 800 programs um, in the program in the builder partnerships programs. And what I go when I go walk job sites, I find, well, they're not submitting for the hot water heater. They're not submitting for the shelving. They're not submitting for the, the, the door locks. They're not, and all that stuff is, is available. Just go through your specifications and look at the list of products that we have, because you're probably not submitting for everything that you're entitled to on your rebates. Right now, like I said, cash is king. Pay attention to that. We got the training online and live courses. Uh, we're going to have the uh, um, the internet marketing class, uh, and then Jim's going to be doing a class next week. Uh, so we've got we're we're back into the webinar arena and trying to be here helping you uh, on with online uh, c training. We've got Ed now doing remote consulting. He if if you're looking at trying to get uh, improve your purchasing department, we've got Rick who can help you with that. If you're looking at trying to look at your plans and try to get the costs out of your plans, Ed can do that. As long as you've got electronic plans, Ed can do that. Do that uh, uh, and distant on, over the internet. Um, the uh, direct data transfer, that's the API. We've got that set up now with Mark Systems and COVA. Uh, we do a lot of surveys, which we'll be doing uh, more so now than ever. And we also have our builder groups. And the builder groups are support groups. I've spent the last two weeks meeting with each one of my builder groups for an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, and I've got tomorrow is an all day meeting with, with my builder groups, kind of, it's group therapy. And okay, this is what I'm experiencing. This is what I'm going through. This is kind of the things I've implemented and so forth, sharing ideas, especially during this period of time. If you're interested in that, uh, we have, we have on our builder groups, we have 
the purchasing managers meet, we have the production managers meet, we have the builders meet uh, in their own meetings. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, just contact my office and let me know on that. Next slide. I want to get, uh, that's just the manufacturers that we've got uh, in the builder partnerships. Now, I want to turn this over to Jim because we just went through a webinar or, or a seminar on the SBA loan options that we have available uh, for the COVID-19 legislation and the SBA loans. And we've got a spreadsheet, a very quick spreadsheet that we'll put up. We we had a, one of our uh, cons one of our service providers uh, that's a CPA operation did a, a two-hour webinar on this uh, the other day. And so flip to the next slide and then let Jim go through this. Okay, uh, let's do this quickly. I'm going to talk a little bit about the management reasons why we want to look at some of these loans and what's going on and some of the rest of the CARES Act provisions. Uh, not a, most of the information I've gotten is from the SBA directly from some, from some bankers who work with them and then a whole bunch of webinars and and research that I've seen over the last week because this is so new. Um, first of all, let's talk about the management reasons. Um, if almost every everything that's being offered right now is a loan. So um, th th there are some exceptions to that, but just remember whatever you borrow, there's a very high likelihood that you're gonna have to pay it back. At least your business will. So you gotta make sure that you you can actually pay that back over the next you know, two to, to 10 years, depending on the terms of these loans. Um, the second thing is related to the management aspect is go apply for everything. You don't have to take it. You don't have to, you just go apply for it. It's gonna to begin tomorrow and some of the loan, loans will, will stop being offered within a, a couple months and they're gonna be offered first come first serve basis. So just go apply for them. You don't have to actually sign the loan documents. You don't actually have to use the loan proceeds. You can always pay it back sooner, or you don't even have to take it if you decide you're, you don't want to do that loan. Um, so those, those are the first two things. The next thing is related to the rest of the CARES Act provisions. There are an awful lot of provisions that are income and payroll tax related. Go talk to your tax advisor about them. Do that right away. Those are some of the best ones that are available to every business because you'll get payroll tax rebates depending on how many people you retain on your payroll and how much you pay them. So go, go do those right away. Those, those could be some of the best ones and they're credits, they're not loans. They're, they're reductions in your taxes. I am not gonna spend the time on going through the details of that, first of all, because they're really um, in, intense and they're, they're highly accounting and tax oriented. So go talk to your, your tax advisor about those uh, and do those, for, make sure you're doing those a lot. Okay, um, the, the other thing I wanna, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the three main loan options that are available that you can see on your screen here. The first, there's, there's one option uh, that is not on the screen and it's just basically a $10,000 loan. It looks like it's all forgivable. It's a very simple loan application to go do for any business that's under 500 employees. Just go do that. It's, it's on the SBA website. Just go get that 10 grand. And, uh, and then if you decide that it, it has to be paid back, you don't want to use it, then just go pay it back. But for some, every, everything I'm talking about right now and uh, these loan options here, we are just learning, just in the past week, that the SBA is just learning what these mean. They're just setting up rules and guidelines and forms as to how to do it. It's gonna change every day. Every day I'm looking on their website, there's something new. Every lender is, is coming up with their new ways of doing that. So don't, don't take whatever I'm saying here to be as gospel in the way it's always gonna be because it's just changing every moment. Um, let me, uh, and, and we will show you that SBA website in just, just a moment on the next slide. You can also Google, it's really easy, SBA disaster stuff. It's, it's very easy, everybody's finding it right now. So let me, let me go through the, 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 the biggest one 
uh, that's being, being talked about right now is this paycheck protection loan, which is right there in the middle, right? Uh, it's basically a 3.75% interest rate loan. Um, if you have 500 employees or, or fewer, you can apply for it. Uh, most likely you can get it even if you have more than $39.5 million of revenue as a builder, although you're gonna have to check, check with your banks about it. This is being done by your bank. It is not being done through SBA. Yeah, the 39, in the 39 million, if you go to the SBA documentation, it, it talks about the 39 million, but any of the documentation that we're seeing on the loans, it doesn't include that. Yeah, so, so it, it, it's, you're just gonna have to find out. I would apply anyway. In fact, the SBA folks say, go apply and then we'll work it through. Um, so the, this, the, the best part about this loan is down there, uh, three or four items from the bottom, it's called, is forgiveness available? So if you spend this, if you borrow this loan, uh, which is basically two and a half times your annual payroll, uh, um, yeah, uh, two and a half times your, your average monthly payroll, sorry about uh, that. It's an av average of the year for the, for the month and you get two right. and a half months. Yeah, it's basically two and a half months of, uh, two and a half of, of an average month's payroll. Um, if you borrow that loan amount, then you can actually get eight weeks forgiven, potentially all of that loan amount could be forgiven uh, if you use it to pay payroll, rent, mortgage, and utilities, and you basically have the same level of payroll that you did before. There, there's some very specific guidelines and all that stuff, so you have to read it and talk to your lender about it, but that's probably the, the best deal there is. You can, you can basically pay eight weeks of, of those kinds of operating expenses and get that loan forgiven. And that forgiveness is not even taxed because most loan forgivenesses uh, are treated as ordinary income by the IRS. So that, that's probably one of the best ones. Um, so go, go apply for it, whether you decide to use it or not. Uh, the disaster. Go ahead. The, the, the thing to understand is that is going to be administered by your bank. Uh, I've yep. been talking to Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo still doesn't have the application form uh, put together yet. There is an application form that's on the SBA um, site. It's the wrong form. At least that's what the, my Wells Fargo told me is that's not the form that they're going to use. Uh, Wells Fargo supposedly We'll have the form available tomorrow, tomorrow at some point. Yep. Um, next loan I want to talk about. So Chuck's right. It's going to change. So check with your bankers on that. Um, and, and then you might even want to apply at different banks to see if you can get it done faster. Uh, and not all banks and credit unions do SBA loans. So your banker may not even do it. So you got to go apply somewhere else anyway. Um, the other one I want to talk to is on the far right. It's the disaster loan. Uh, that's the one that has the advanced grant of $10,000 available. So just go apply for that right away. It's a, it's a straight loan. The good thing about it doesn't require personal guarantees and probably won't require uh, real estate as collateral, although they will, will put a lien on as many assets as they can of the business. So you got my, it's mainly for working capital. It's a more traditional loan. It's going to cost you three and three quarters. It's through the SBA. Again, apply for it and then decide if you really want to use it because you're going to have to pay it back over a 30 year time, time frame. You'll probably get six to 12 months of principal deferred. It's a decent low interest rate loan. It's got some good terms. So, so go look at it and, and, and at least apply for it. You can decide if you're going to actually take it later on. Finally, there's the traditional SBA loan, and, and go take a look at that because they're not bad deals. They're low interest rate. They typically want real estate as collateral. And, and I, think, really I, think you can go, I think you can go max 25,000 without uh, collateral and after 25,000, you have to have collateral great. in it and typically they want real estate. There, there are limits you can get uh, lower, lower um, lower requirements for 25,000, another one for 200,000. I'm just going for the worst case. Um, 
So, but go look at that loan as well, because that might be a very good loan for, for long-term holdings of land and, and other assets that you might have. It's a low interest rate, long-term loan. It might be a very good choice. Um, those are the main ones. So I, 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 almost every question you're gonna ask is about the specifics of it. Go talk to an SBA specialist or set up some time when we can talk about the, the for your specific situation on a consulting basis. But you, the best choices are looking at the SBA website and going and talk to your bankers who know something about SBA. And then the last, the other thing is definitely go talk to your tax advisors because th th that's got stuff that's going to start right away that you can you can use through tax credits. Yep, and it's, it, Ch Chad's right. He talks about this on the webinar. It is there are lenders who who are SBA lenders and others aren't. It's pretty easy to find out who who does SBA loans. Wells Fargo does some of the other big banks, and then there's some specialized SBA lenders as well. It is on the website, so go ahead if you want to switch to that next uh, slide. I think we have the the website on there. Um, and, and you can Google it now and it's really, it pops up really, really quickly. A couple of days ago, it didn't so much. So they're doing, doing a great job of, of providing information on that website. I'll stop from there, Chuck. Looks like he might've stepped away for a second. Um, okay. So real quickly, I'm going to put up a poll and then I think um, we'll go straight, yep, straight to questions and answers. So I'm going to throw up a poll. If you guys can take just a second to answer um, and then we'll take any additional question and answers, but um, then I'll put that. Uh, Emma Jane, can you go back to that website page? Yes. Okay, that way they, it's up there so that they can, they can take down the notes. And by the way, while she's, she's getting the questions in, we had 250. Oh no, 60, 265 people at least. That registered for this, when we only had space for 100. So I got 160 irate people probably that got turned away. The good news is, is that at the close of this webinar, there will be an email that should be sent out to everybody who registered with a link to the on-demand um, recording of this webinar. So if you were not able to get in, you'll be able to watch it on your own um, at, at your leisure. Or if you are on it, you can um, re-watch it and fast forward to the parts that you want to uh, get more information on or to listen to again if you weren't able to get all your notes down. Are these uh, are these slides available? They can, yeah we can we can make them available as well uh, through a PDF. Just need to email me and I can I can send them to you as a PDF. All right, thanks. Okay, what do you got, Emma Jane? Well, it looks like nobody has answered the questions yet, so I'm okay. up for thirty more seconds and then. Does anybody raise their hand? There's one question that just came up apparently. Oh, yep, here's a question. How long do we have to apply for the SBA loans? Days they, or months? They start tomorrow. Um, and then for the most part, I would plan on two months, roughly, I've heard three months. But I, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, the, the sooner you apply, the better, because there's kind of a first come first served as to right. how much you how many people uh, go and look for these loans. So you want to be in line. Um, but the, the, pr probably if you start applying for it in the next week or so, you'll you'll probably have a good chance. That's my guess. Yeah, some of the information that I'm getting back is it's what was it, three hundred eighty-five billion dollars or something like that. I mean, it was a pretty big number, but people are saying it's going to go pretty fast and it's all on a first come first serve basis. So the earlier you can get your application in, the better. So it looks like. I got a note saying that they didn't see the poll. One person has seen the poll. So if um, is anybody else is anybody else having trouble seeing the poll? 
I don't know. I have 13 people on chat. Okay. Well, um, so I guess this one person was able to see it. I'm not sure why it's not showing it to everybody, but our questions were, um, have you put together a survival plan? Are you communicating with your banks, bank or banks? And then how long do you think this will last? Um, so those are just some things we want you to, to think about as, you know, as we're completing this webinar to think about whether or not you have those things in place and think about how long you think this will last. Um, our, our choices were three months, six months, nine months, one year or longer. And think about how that's gonna impact your business and what kind of plans you're gonna have in place moving forward. So I will. You have one question come, that came in. Uh, we already answered oh, that. Oh, we already answered that. Uh, do we have any other questions? They're all real quiet. Well, you were we very either, We either answered all their questions or we scared the living bejeebers out of them. <laughs> Shell-shocked is what we got from somebody. Uh, yes, I would say the whole industry is shell-shocked because we were on the way to having one of the greatest years and home building we've had almost in a generation. Yep, and we got a lot. Um, Cindy says it's a lot to process and Jason Hughes um, says thank you. So it's, a, it's our pleasure and we're here to help. Yes. I wish um, it wasn't my fifth time to do this. <laughs> Very true. Um, so with that being said, um, Chuck has a quote that he put up here that he is not, um, I'm not a product of my circumstances. I'm a product of my decisions. And so we want you guys to go out and, and take what you've learned here today, apply it to your business as needed. And remember that you have to fight through this time period and have a plan to get through it through worst case scenario, but also keeping a positive mental outlook as well as, as best you can. Um, yep. Wanna thank our sponsor ECI for, for supporting us today. Um, I don't know, Chuck, do you have anything else you would like to say? The, the only thing I would say is you may never implement, you put this plan together, you put this, these 20 items in place. You may never have to use it, but don't throw it in the trash can. Keep it as an outline for the next time we have an economic cycle and dust it off because this is, this is the fifth time that we've gone through this in my lifetime in 50 years of working with you guys. And we forget, you got 10, 15 years between these time frames, and you totally forget what you did the last time to survive. What I'm after is for all of you to survive. Um, we lost, I think we only lost one of our builders during the recession and what we're here to do is to help you survive through this so that you can grow as we come out uh on the other side so i uh, just understand that's what we're doing um we're going to be doing a lot of webinars uh as as we go forward we can't do seminars anymore uh emma jane had the hotels calling calling her saying you know that seminar that you had scheduled uh we canceled you <laughs> So it wasn't just us canceling, it was the hotels canceling us uh, for, for the on-site training. Uh, we're gonna be doing internet training. We're also putting together, um, I have a thing called the Home Builder University. We're putting courses together, hour and a half uh, classes uh, for uh, a series, maybe about six weeks for your staff uh, and there'll be a syllabus for each one of those classes. Uh, so we're, we're putting that together. That'll be announced. I've got a, a, a task force right now that's putting that, all that stuff together. We'll make that announcement as we come, come forward on doing the on, online training for your staff. So with that, uh, anything else? I think we're good. I just oh. suggested oh. start. As Sergeant Phil used to say in Hill Street Blues, let's be careful out there, ladies and gentlemen. Take care. Yeah.
Take care. Lisa, Lisa just put a note together. She says, we are taking reservations for the fall on-site <laughs> seminar. So anyway. Absolutely. We will back, be back live in the fall, but for the time being, keep, keep an eye out for all of our virtual webinars and um, keep hopeful that we'll be able to be back at, live in the fall because that's where we do our best training is when we're face-to-face. -face. Have a great day. Um, hopefully you guys uh, got a little bit out of today and, and you'll be making those plans. We'd love to hear from you. If you need any additional services, feel free to contact us through any of the ways that are listed on this slide. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Best of luck.